So I'm here to talk about microwaves, uh, specifically smart microwaves. So when I say smart microwaves, I'm sure many of you think Internet of Things. And if you're charitable, you think of Internet of Things that way. If you're less charitable, you may think of it that way. Um, <laughs> so I'm more in the second camp where um, I'm not a big fan of adding complexity to the devices gratuitously. So why am I working on this? Well, because I think we're actually doing something kind of interesting. Our devices can actually direct heat inside the microwave. If you've ever tried to cook things in a microwave, um, you probably haven't tried raw chicken because it comes out terribly. Um, <laughs> this is an example. Um, you can't see it, uh, the temperature's reading off. The yellow wires are temperature probes. But the lower one is uh, reading around 95 degrees. The upper one's reading around 30 degrees, which, you know, not food safe, do not eat. <laughs> um, in our device, we can actually cook a piece of chicken fairly evenly, consistently, uh, keeping it juicy and fairly tasty. And we can do that every time. So how does that work? Oh, and also, we can cook two different foods to two different temperatures. So this graph. <laughs> yep, forgot the important part. Um, so this graph is actually showing a cooking run of salmon and asparagus. The salmon is the set of blue lines, and we wanted it to be uh, targeting around minimum 65 degrees, maximum 70 degrees. Uh, the asparagus is the uh, red lines. And as you can see, it's less grouped and less, uh, less tightly grouped, less smooth. That's because asparagus has lots of thin parts, spiky parts, and so on. So by nature, it's going to be harder to get the control we want. But we did a pretty good job here. So how does, it, how does this work? Well, before I go into that, I'm going to quickly review how a microwave actually works. In a microwave, you've got a few major parts. You've got the magnetron, uh, which actually makes the microwaves. That makes, the parts, that makes things get hot. You've got the waveguide, which takes the microwaves, moves them over to the antenna. And the antenna emits the microwaves into the cavity. Once they get into the cavity, they bounce around and create a standing wave pattern, which creates stable hot and cold spots. And that's why you get uneven cooking in a microwave. So our device is basically the same thing. We've got some competitors, and they're trying to do this with um, solid state uh, microwave technology, but we're not because it's expensive. It's around a dollar a watt. So for a regular microwave, you'd be looking at at least $1,500 just for the emission, not even counting any of the other parts. What we did was we built this uh, top module board, uh, and that board essentially is each one of these uh, paddle things is an antenna. Uh, the antennas can create different standing wave patterns in the uh, cavity. So that looks like this. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of what you're looking at before I play the video. What you're looking at is a, board, is a fiberglass board with a bunch of LEDs on it. I'm sure you couldn't tell. Uh, each LED has a, um, has a little antenna attached. The antenna picks up the microwave radiation and lights up the LED if there's power on it. Um, this isn't a great visualization for two reasons. First off, when you take the board out, the interaction with the microwaves means that the hotspots completely move around. Um, so the hotspot that shows up with the board is not the hotspot that you get without the board. But you, um, and the second one is that the LEDs are somewhat nonlinear, which means that you don't take, the LED brightness doesn't map very well to the uh, temperature that you get. But it still makes a really cool demo and gives you an idea of what sort of thing we do. So here's the video. As you can see, we get fairly uh, divergent um, uh, heat, hot spots and cold spots. And what can we do with this? Well, we want to start doing function fitting. So if you think back to calculus class, you may remember Fourier series. Um, and these are not exactly what we use, but they're the inspiration. So if you add up, you can create any arbitrary function using a linear basis set of other functions. In this case, sine waves. Um, a single sine wave, you get, well, a sine wave. Uh, add up five of them, you start to get something that looks kind of like your goal, which in this example is a, uh, a square wave. Add up 15 of them, you get something that's looking pretty close. Add up an infinite amount, and you get that shape. Uh, well, we don't actually have a, a sine wave generator, so how do we deal with that? Well, the reason that this works is because the basis functions that you use for Fourier series, Chebyshev polynomials, or Taylor series, or any of these other similar things, form a uh, linearly independent basis set. Well, we can kind of break things up into 
and that's because they're in a, a linear independently basis, in linearly independent basis set in a vector space. Well, we can kind of break this uh, food up into a set of chunks and treat that as a vector. So we can start uh, to kind of say, well, we've got these function things. Can we kind of massage them and filter them down to a basis set or a basis-ish set? So we have them, we, get, we pick the most useful ones and uh, normally we'd have more than three, but I've only got so much space on the slides. So, you ha so we take the average rise in temperature versus rise in time and shove those into vectors. Then we t and now that we've got them in vectors, we can add them up like regular vectors and operate on, on them like regular vectors. So, um, and now we have a target temperature. We have a uh, set of rise in temperature versus rise in time vectors. How do we solve for uh, finding the ones that we should use and for how long? Uh, all we do is toss it into the non-negative least squares algorithm. Non-negative least squares um, essentially takes the uh, expression ax minus y and finds the value of x for which we have the smallest result of that expression. So in this exp equation, a represents the set of all uh, resultant vectors, the dtemp by dt vectors that we were talking about. X is the amount of time we spend in each configuration. And Y is our target temperature. Um, so here's an example with the previous values. The first column is the first vector from above. The second column is the second vector. The third column is the third vector. And we want to get the uh, temperature up to 65, 65, 65 in the first three squares, 85 in the other two squares, 65 in the third square. So we toss it into the non-negative least square solver. And it says spend 30 seconds in this configuration, 75 seconds in this configuration, and 27 and a half in this configuration. Um, because these three vectors are numbers that I just kind of pulled out of thin air, and they aren't exactly great, um, uh, the actual amount of error if you run through this is something like 20 degrees off of our target. But for three vectors that I made up, it's not too bad. <laughs> Um, in reality, it turns out that with uh, many more vectors, uh, I don't know if they want me to tell you how many, <laughs> but uh, many more vectors uh, and across actual foods, I think we usually get down to about five degrees off target in any realistic situation. Obviously, if you have a piece of, uh, if you have really cold water and you want to boil a cup right beside it, we can't do that. There's physics that we have to deal with. But if you want to get uh, food to you know, different realistic temperatures, we can do a pretty good job. Now, that's the easy part. The hard part is that how do we actually replay these vectors, or how do we know that we can use these vectors, and how do we get them? So it turns out that food changes the behavior. If you take a piece of chicken and put it in, then take a steak and swap it out, the stake has a different shape. It interacts with the waves differently. You get a different standing wave pattern. So, oh shit, it doesn't work anymore. Um, well, the first thought people have is, can't you just simulate it? No. <laughs> uh, first off, if you wanted to simulate it, you would need to have a very accurate physical model of the food. Um, and I don't think we want to hire someone to uh, you know, create an accurate 3D model of your piece of chicken before you can cook it <laughs> and put it in. Um, it also turns out that the simulation itself is slow. So simulating a single configuration takes something like 10 minutes. So if you wanted to do enough for a full cooking run, it would probably take, oh, all afternoon. And then you could cook it, and it would cook really quickly. <laughs> Not practical. So the next thing is peop ask, people ask is, can you throw machine learning at it? The answer is also no. <laughs> um, machine learning likes problems that are smooth, in a way. So where you can take a single, you, know, you can take a step and get closer to the solution, essentially. Um, the configurations don't work that way. Uh, what happens is, as you move the paddles, or a paddle, you'll get the same configuration with the hotspot here, and then suddenly there's an inflection point, and the hotspot teleports, or the, conf the standing wave pattern completely shifts. So you don't get a smooth transition. Uh, there's no underlying structure that we know of for the neural net to pick up. I mean, there is one, but 
we don't know how to make the neural nets pick it up, and it's not clear that it'll be faster to get that than to uh, simulate. So open research topic, if anyone knows how to do it, I will, I'm listening. <laughs> uh, so what we, do, what we actually do is we have a, uh, we just reuse the configs. You cooked something last time, we got these heating patterns. Well, cool, so if you put the same or similar enough food in the same location, we'll get the uh, same heating pattern. And it turns out that there is actually a pretty big window where food is same enough to replay it, so you don't have to get an accurate model of each, uh, say, each chicken breast. You just need to know it's close enough. And in practice, it seems to work reasonably well if you have a constrained enough set of locations for the food. Uh, so in the end, here's the result. Um, and this is another video where we're going to heat the different cups to different temperatures. And first off, the red one's going to start boiling. Then we take a temperature measurement. And I don't know if you can read it, but we've got roughly a 25, degree, uh, 25 Celsius difference between the two cups. Put in cold water, swap it out, same thing. And now the green one's going to boil first. And sure, this is easy mode, but <laughs> it's still a good demo. Um, cool. So I realized, and it's an afterthought, that some of you might wonder what this device looks like, so I threw in a picture. <laughs> uh, last minute slide change. Um, that's it.